Um, all right, I am going to uh, disappear and leave okay. it to the two of you, and uh, then uh, uh, it'll all be yours. Um, and yell for me if you guys need any help. Okay. So um, I think what I'm going to do now is, am I? I think I'm supposed to introduce you, Dwight. Um, so. Dwight tonight is going to speak to us about the Leviathan of Parsonstown, which is this amazing telescope that was built in the in the 1800s in Ireland. And uh, I remember as a child seeing this amazing drawing of this gigantic telescope from the 1800s, and it immediately captured my imagination. And I've always wanted to learn more about it. So tonight is my chance. And so Dwight has visited the location in Burcastle in uh, County Ophia, Ireland, and he's going to show us some pictures. Um, about his trip there. Uh, and by the way, Dwight, when he's not visiting ancient telescopes, which sounds like a fascinating uh, venture to me, he lives and travel. He lives, of course, as you just heard in, in Maine, and he travels throughout New England and Eastern Canada, attending astronomy meetings as liaison for clubs in Maine, New Hampshire, and a few in Massachusetts, and observing at their star parties when the opportunity avails. And professionally, Dwight is a licensed professional electrical engineer. And uh, so, Dwight, without any further ado, the Leviathan of Parsonstown, please. All right. I'm going to try to get the uh, screen sharing going here. Let's hope it works. Uh, Looks good to me. There we go. Hopefully that uh, that's showing up OK. It is indeed. All right. Um, we'll uh, move on here. Uh, this started out as a. Uh, I was looking for something to do back in uh, 2018, uh, and I've I've visited a lot of astronomy clubs around New England, as you as you said, and I wanted to do something different. I had done a uh, an astronomy tour of of Paris, and I've also visited uh, uh, in uh, Cal uh, in uh, England the uh, uh, the uh, Greenwich Observatory there. And so I was looking for something. And then I remembered that I'd seen in the literature a, this ancient telescope in, uh, uh, in some place in Europe. And I, I did a little research and discovered it was in Ireland, which put it pretty close to where I live. So let's get started here. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, start off with uh, a little description of the uh, the castle. Uh, Burr Castle encompasses about 1,277 acres, including gardens, a castle, a science center, and a modern Lothar tele a radio telescope installation, and of course the uh, Leviathan of, of Parsons Town Telescope. Um, it. Uh, it is still a, uh, a, there is a formal castle there, and this is the, uh, the gatehouse that welcomes you into the, to the castle grounds. And uh, the castle is still a residence and is currently occupied by the seventh Earl of Rossi, Brendan Parsons. Uh, the castle's been on the ground since 1170. And I want you to take note of the three Gothic arched windows in this. Um, I was surprised to see actual uh, cannon artillery still on the site. And there's still a, uh, a dry moat surrounding the castle. So uh, it turns out that uh, the, Earl, uh, the Earl of Rossi used that for casting his, uh, his mirrors. Um, the third Earl of Rossi, Williams Parson, was a multi-talented politician, astronomer, and engineer. And you can see some of his projects. He, he built the first uh, suspension bridge in Ireland, and he actually put an uh, electric turbine on, his, uh, on the River Camcor. So he had early electricity in the uh, early part of the 1800s on, on uh, his site. Um, the, the award-winning uh, gardens at Burr Castle have been open to the public since the 17th century. Uh, tickets and memberships to the public are the main source of income for maintaining the grounds. 
And we'll talk a little bit about the telescope just to get uh, familiarization. Uh, walking across the grounds, finally, I spotted the, the telescope uh, located near the center of the grounds. And approaching from the north, from the rear, you'll see uh, those uh, protrusions at the back, which are called the horns to the north. Those will expl be explained uh, shortly. And here you see that the Earl of Rossi, William Parsons, was obviously concerned about the aesthetics of this massive installation. Along the east wall, he mimicked the castle's Gothic arches. Uh, from the interpretive signage that I'm reading there on in the lower part of the screen, uh, it says uh, the, this 72 inch reflector was built in 1845 and was the largest telescope in the world for 70 years until the completion of the 100 inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson in 1917. This is the 1995 reconstructed version of the telescope. I'll discuss the features of the telescope, but first I wanna describe a few of uh, Parsons observations. Uh, William Parsons' most famous discovery was the spiral arms of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I'm amazed at how close it is to, uh, to the modern Hubble astrophoto. He did a sketch of M, uh, M1 uh, done at the Leviathan. Uh, Parsons named it the Crab Nebula based upon an image that he observed a few years earlier with his 36-inch uh, telescope. There is an extensive uh, exhibit hall at the Reception and Science Center. And here's an interesting interpretation of, uh, of an image through the scope. Uh, uh, of the uh, Orion Nebula. Although uh, astrophotography was contemplated, the photographic technology of the time was not sensitive enough. The stone walls were specifically built for the telescope and are 23 feet apart, 40 feet high, and 71 feet long. Uh, the space between the walls allowed the telescope about an hour of tracking from, from left wall to right wall or vice versa from east wall to west wall. The length of the tube is about 54 feet and including the mirror, it weighs about 12 tons. Now, if you stop and think about this for a moment, he had to develop the technology for uh, casting the 72 inch mirrors. Uh, up to this point, he had only made the 36 inch mirrors. And besides that, think of his commitment to this project. He had to construct a support mechanism that would hold up this 12-ton uh, uh, telescope. Uh, so he couldn't, couldn't exactly do it with a wooden frame like he'd done with the 36-inch uh, the telescope. So he was committed to figuring out how to cast a 72-inch mirror and building this enormous castle-like structure just to hold the thing up so that he could aim it and, and utilize it. Uh, Michael Tudbury uh, of Dennis O'Leary and Partners was an engineer and amateur astronomer, and he was selected as the engineering consultant to oversee the design and restoration back in 1995. Uh, I'll just go back for a moment. That that drawing that I found in a in in the book uh, William Parsons, Third Earl of Ross, Astronomy in the Castle in the 19th Century. That drawing was about two inches by four inches, so there wasn't a whole lot of detail that I could see. So I expanded the uh, the drawing and did my own version of it. And utilizing the photos that I had taken there during my visit, I reconstructed this, uh, this drawing of the, the full telescope. We'll talk about uh, some of the features of the, of the telescope. Uh, there are four mechanisms. 
an altitude mechanism, an azimuth mechanism, the lower gallery and the upper galleries, and finally the 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 we'll talk about the mirror and how that was uh, cast and utilized. First, the altitude mechanism. The universal joint at the mirror end of the tube was one of the few metal pieces that was salvaged from the original 1940, uh, 1845 telescope. It was tested in place to make sure that it could still support the 12 ton telescope tube. But uh, being that massive uh, piece of cast iron, that really, I don't think was much of a concern. At the front of the scope, you'll notice a pulley uh, that it attaches to the front of the, uh, the tube of the telescope right here. And uh, that attaches to the altitude lifting cable. And above and behind at the other end of the telescope, uh, let me move this out of the way. There's a uh, truss lifting pulley, uh, and that holds up the support beam uh, that, uh, that, uh, that holds the pulley that, uh, that allows the, uh, the telescope tube to be lifted. Uh, the purpose of the horns to the north is to port this truss beam. We'll see that in a moment here. Uh, note the meridian arc on the east wall uh, and is a, this is utilized as a guide rail for the azimuth beam that we'll talk about in a moment. Above and behind the other end of the telescope is a truck, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, the lifting cable attaches to a slow motion control that I will explain in the next slide. But first, there is a counterweighted sliding dual eyepiece mount that you see the, the dual eyepiece, a low power and a high power. And you see that this is on a uh, counterweight so that when the telescope is tilted upwards to uh, near vertical, that will support the weight of the, uh, of the uh, uh, eye, two eyepieces. Um, the low power eyepiece was 216 power with a field of view of about 26 minutes of arc suitable for viewing the moon. Star tests were performed on eighth, ninth magnitude stars at 750 power. Views described ranged from balls of light like small peas violently boiling in, at the consequence of atmospheric disturbance to moments when it appeared like light shining through a minute needle hole placed in front of a flame. So they had uh, atmospheric issues, especially there in Ireland. Uh, that's not probably the best uh, uh, location for a telescope, but that's where. This is a detail showing the, uh, uh, the lifting uh, cable attaches to the slow motion control. Uh, the slow motion control is a crank mechanism that goes to the universal joint that goes to a pillow block and a, and a bevel gear. And what this does is this screws into this slide block that pulls in on the uh, on the lifting cable. So that's how they did the, uh, the uh, slow motion vertical control. On the back, you can see the, uh, the other end of the, uh, the lifting pulley on the, uh, on, the, on the trust beam. And so this lifting cable comes down to the, uh, uh, to the winch at the, uh, center rear of the telescope. And there was an operator back there that would run, run the winch. Um, here's a detail of the, uh, of the truss tube. Of the, uh, of the uh, 
uh, trust uh, support mechanism. And this, uh, they had, uh, the altitude winch is secured to a table installed above the ground. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. In the original 1845 installation, there was a manual windlass. Uh, the handle's not shown on this one. This windlass is similar to the original. It was uh, found on an Irish dock. As, as I said, they decided that they were gonna put in a uh, hydraulic uh, winch so that they could uh, run the thing remotely. And there you can see a detail of the hydraulic winch and the uh, in the uh, hydraulic uh, fluid and, and components are in the box at the bottom. Now we'll go on to the azimuth mechanism. This is accessed uh, from the trolley cart, the azimuth control. You can see uh, this rod here it's missing the handle, which would be like this one up here. And that goes down to this mechanism. And now we're looking from the front, goes to an azimuth worm gear. And that worm gear goes from the front of the tube about five feet back to a uh, rack and pinion gear, which drives the azimuth beam. And you can see the uh, rack and pinion on the gear on the thrust timber. This thrust timber would go over and it uh, was attached by wheels to the meridian circle. And here you can see the, the uh, uh, right ascension markings on the, uh, on the thrust timber. Now we'll talk a little bit about the lower gallery observation cart. Uh, here you see the cart in front of the uh, uh, telescope, and it's on a it's on a uh, uh, railroad uh, track. And this this cart was used up to forty five degrees angle for the uh, observer to uh, observe in the tube. And so you climb up these stairs, climb into the cart. And then you could use this crank over here to crank the uh, trolley cart into position so you were near the, uh, the eyepiece of the telescope tube. And the trolley cart railway uh, goes, uh, goes wall to wall uh, across the front of the, uh, uh, of the construction. In 1995, they added, uh, uh, during the uh, renovation, they added some motor controls to the, uh, to the uh, trolley cart, and they added a bunch of limit switches so that they wouldn't accidentally run the, uh, the trolley cart off, off the edge of the, uh, the railroad or some of the other adjustments. But as you can see, some of it's coming apart. Uh, repairs are necessarily necessary. Unfortunately, the maintenance costs were high and the telescope is not currently operational. This shows a diagram of how the, uh, the trolley cart, uh, the truss assembly is lifted up the incline. So this, this would follow the uh, telescope up. And you can see that this is counterbalanced with a uh, counter, what they call a counterpoise or a counterweight. And this has a chain that goes down to the uh, bottom of a pit and then goes through a tunnel. And we'll show you where that goes in just a moment. And there's a close up showing the, uh, uh, the lower uh, gallery uh, raised truss assembly. So this, this whole V truss would, would slide up and down. And you can see this is now next to the telescope where you would be observing. And you can see the, the telescope is, is beside the cart. 
Uh, the thrust timber, which is down here, goes over and attaches to the meridian circle. The uh, observation uh, counterpoise is in place. Uh, and then you've got your slow motion controls for azimuth and vertical, as well as the, uh, as the observation cart positioning controls. Now, I showed you, um, whoops, let's go back here. I mentioned earlier that there's a chain that goes from the counterpoise there's two of them, one on each side. The counterpoise goes under this walkway through a tunnel to the lower gallery windlass. One of the things that confused me in the uh, trying to understand the operation of this telescope is they mislabeled the azimuth uh, windlass. Uh, they mislabeled this uh, windlass as the azimuth windlass, indicating that it somehow pushed the uh, uh, the telescope back and forth when actually what it was its function was was to raise and lower the uh, the lower gallery. Here's a close up of the, uh, the windlass. And here you can see the actual uh, counterpoise on the uh, on the west wall. And there's another one on the right wall, uh, east wall, just just like it. Now we're going to look at the inside of the uh, of the telescope construction and how that that's counterweighted. This is the whoops. This is the main connection to the telescope tube. Again, remember that telescope tube weighed twelve tons with the mirror in it. So there's one of these uh, on each side of the telescope. And you can see over here a counterweight, and here it is a little bit up closer. This counterweight is, uh, this chain comes from the telescope, and then the counterweight attaches to the other end of that chain. And what it does is it swings down, because uh, this chain is also connected to the horns to the north. And it swings down, so as the telescope gets more and more vertical, uh, there's less and less pull on the telescope. So we can see that here. As you lift up the telescope to the, to the crane, this counterweight swings down. So rather than have the telescope slam into the crane up above, this, uh, this is a fixed uh, length chain here, and it swings down into the uh, counterpoise pit. And that confused me when I was there in, in uh, Ireland, trying to figure out what was going on with these pits. Uh, nowhere on the drawings that I uh, saw, because I was dealing with just a tiny little drawing to begin with, does it show this arc? But I finally figured out what was going on. And then it, it, it occurred to me how clever uh, the Earl was on, on working out all the structural details of this, uh, of this telescope. Now I mentioned before that the uh, the telescope is up on a on a plat the windlass uh, the elevation windlass is up on a uh, a platform and I couldn't understand why would they go to the bother of putting this this uh, altitude windlass up on a platform when that's going to take a lot of effort to anchor that into the ground because it's pulling up on this. Uh, 12 ton telescope and at the beginning of the pole, it's got to uh, have some significant pull. Well, then it finally dawned on me that, well, they probably use these, uh, I, I knew that they use these carts for loading the mirrors into the, uh, into the telescope. So it, it finally dawned on me that the uh, altitude windlass could be used for lowering the mirror down this uh, raked uh, uh, railroad to the loading platform. And if the windlass was down at ground level, uh, it, would be, it would be dragging up over the ground. So they raised that up so that it would have a, a clear line of sight to get down there. And we're gonna move on to the upper galleries. You see one, once you get above 45 degrees, that uh, initial lower gallery at the front of the telescope would no longer get you next to the telescope. So they had these upper galleries, and this is the one 
is one showing the, uh, the North Gallery being pushed out slightly. And so you, uh, um, yes, uh, the, uh, the initial lower gallery could only take you up to about 45 degrees. And then you had to transfer up to the upper galleries in order to, to, to get to the uh, higher elevations. Uh, note the length of the support arms. These are the support arms for the galleries. And what you have is these counter affecting uh, wheels that push down on this because as, as this gets pushed out into the, over the uh, chasm where the telescope is, uh, there's tremendous force that's developed there. And you can see the counter affecting wheels, how much, uh, how that's pushing down. And if you look at the, uh, let's just back up for a moment. If you look at the massive bolting and the weight of the, uh, of the structure that's above that to, to, uh, to provide some solid mounting, uh, but you see how massive the flange is and how much force there must be on that, uh, on that beam uh, trying to lift that, that uh, counter affecting wheel. Here you see the uh, access to the, uh, you see the access to the, uh, to the upper galleries. Uh, there were four, four assistants that were necessary to run this uh, telescope when the Earl was doing it all mechanically. You had one at the altitude winch in the back. You had a second one to move the galleries in and out on the upper level. You had a third to tend the lamps, because remember, the Earl is now uh, uh, suspended out over this 40-foot chasm, trying to look into the output and trying uh, uh, into the eyepiece and trying to uh, 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 sketch at the same time. And then there was a fourth uh, person at the lower level to uh, run the lower gallery rays and lower or other minor matters that uh, might be yelled down. And here you can see, uh, this is a drone shot from looking down on the gallery. You can see that when the galleries are pushed all the way in, there's a gate here and there's a gate here that allows you to walk in from the staircase into the, uh, into the galleries. I couldn't see from the ground level and I was trying to figure out did they climb over the over the, the railing up there? But uh, forty feet in uh, on a new moon night, that would have been uh, a precarious maneuver at best. Also, note the this building at the uh, the lower right uh, that uh, did not exist originally. That's where. I suspect all of the uh, machinery for the uh, electrical controls and uh, some of the hydraulics and, and other controls was added to, uh, uh, during the 1995 renovation. So we get one last mystery. You get these uh, tremendous uh, uh, levers that, in effect that are pushing the, the galleries out uh, to hold up the uh, hold up the galleries, so when those are extended out uh, twenty feet out over the uh, from the wall, there must have been some tremendous friction in these points. And I have not yet figured out exactly how they maneuvered that, whether it was done with a series of levers and whatever. But I will point out that these these small timbers here, uh, if you zoom in close. I did discover in, in looking at my photos carefully that there's these boxes now with all kinds of wiring connections, which obviously have some limit switches. And I'm wondering if there's some sort of a motor drive that uh, currently drives that out, but I still don't know exactly how the, uh, the Earl managed to uh, get those things pushed out there. This is on the uh, west wall of the, uh, of the uh, uh, the main support walls. And uh, I desperately wanted to go up those stairs, but you can see that wasn't going to happen. 
Uh, I would like to go back and visit there again. And if, and if I do, I'm going to make some sort of arrangement to have uh, a paid representative there to, uh, to open up the gates. I understand that that uh, uh, obsolete telescope uh, tour that was done a number of years ago, they did actually get to climb up there and, and look at the facility up close up above. Uh, I was told that it was kind of scary. All right, mirror loading. So we do have the uh, a turntable at the top. That's one of the original mirror wagons. It's in kind of tough shape, but uh, you can get the idea of the way it worked. Uh, the mirrors, uh, because of corrosion, they had to be exchanged about every six to 12 months and repolished to, uh, to, uh, to Re bring the surfaces back to a reflective surface. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And you can see in the back of this that, that this is the wooden structure for his earlier 36 inch diameter telescope. Uh, during the uh, exchange, the mirror was slowly dragged by 25 to 30 men on a rail track to the polishing machinery in the courtyard of the castle and then about a quarter mile back to the telescope. Um, logically, the altitude windlass was also used to uh, lower and raise the mirror wagon to the mirror box. Note the elevation of the uh, mirror platform that I discussed earlier. And Till I drew this drawing, like I said earlier, I didn't understand the reason for the, the elevation of the, uh, the platform, but here you can see quite clearly that you'd, you'd have to have the, the winch up higher in order to bring it down. And this, and then there was the, I had uh, several uh, more emails that went back and forth with Burr Castle. I kept asking him the questions and they would, go out in their archives and dig up photos and send them to me. This is a photograph of one of the drawings that uh, uh, during the renovation. Um, so I couldn't quite make out on the original small drawing. He called it, I thought it said a lever pit. And from this, I did figure out that, that there was uh, something going on here with these levers, but I couldn't tell whether whether and and remember the uh, the one of the windlasses was called uh, an azimuth windlass, and I kept thinking, well, maybe these levers are used to torque the uh, the scope back and forth, left to right, before I figured out the the full azimuth mechanism. But then they sent me this diagram or this photograph, and I realized, oh, well, the lever pit is really narrow, so they couldn't be dragging it back and forth. It has some other function. And so I drew this drawing of the, uh, of the uh, telescope in a vertical position. And now you can see, they make reference to the fact that there were three levers. I don't know the exact spacing of the levers, but I'm just guessing that what's going on here is the, is the telescope raises and there's less and less uh, pull from, the, uh, uh, from this counterweight that the, uh, the levers would uh, successively uh, be pulled in to, uh, to provide more torque to, uh, to make the, the telescope pull back down when, it, uh, uh, when they wanted to lower it back down. So that would provide them uh, a method of, of going all the way to, to north. And actually I understand from, uh, some, from the research I did in the literature, that they could point the telescope beyond, uh, beyond the zenith and they could go a little bit more north with the, the telescope as well. And there you see the, the mirror box and the mirror loading platform. This mirror loading platform would be removed if they wanted to uh, pivot the telescope further north. 
And there's a picture that they sent me later on of the, uh, the mirror box. I couldn't get close to, to seeing that because they had uh, a fence all the way around the whole thing. And I, I honored their request and I, I thought seriously about jumping over the fence, going in and looking at this stuff, but I, I decided I'd follow all the rules. So now we need to finish up uh, with the mirror, which to me is probably the most amazing thing about this telescope. The mirror was, uh, was built with uh, uh, a speculum metal. Uh, it's kind of a special uh, alloy of, of bronze, only instead of bronze being, uh, uh, oops. Instead of bronze being 18 part copper to one part tin, you can see he has a lot more copper in it to 14.91 parts tin. He spent a lot of time working on this alloy. Uh, the final mixture result is a whitish metal that allows polishing to brilliance with a resistance to tarnishing. But the, the quote is that it is brittle almost beyond belief. But you can see that even this secondary mirror is cracked. Uh, the mirror casting was done in the moat, as, as, uh, as I'd said before. And you can note this tower in the background. He had a watch dial at the top of this that he used for collimating his 36 inch mirror. Uh, wasn't long enough to, uh, to do the, uh, to do the uh, uh, 72 inch mirror. You must have had some other mechanism for that. <clears throat> now the, the mirror, uh, one way, he, he cast five mirrors, uh, or he attempted to cast five mirrors, of which only two were successful. Um, the first one weighed four tons, and the second one was three and a half tons. And the, uh, the second one was a little more flexible than what he liked. But the problem with speculum is, is when, it, when it bends, it doesn't come back. So you, the only way you could get it back in focus again was to take it out of the, uh, out of the telescope, back to the mirror polishing machine and, and refigure the mirror. So anyway, the, the, the big thing that amazed me was, uh, he had to heat up four tons of this speculum metal. So he's got a chimney and he's got this crucible that he's heating up the metal. And then there's a crane that lifts these over into, uh, into an iron basket where they get ready to pour it into the speculum mold. Now the mold was kind of interesting that what it was was a series of concentric uh, metal bands in a, in a ring shape and they could, they could push the bands up and down a little bit and get it to the approximate shape of the, uh, the concave dish of the, uh, of the mirror so that they didn't have to polish it as much. The mirror was cast upside down uh, because any bubbles that formed in the, uh, in the speculum mirror during the pour would float to the rear of the mirror where it'd be out of the way, it wouldn't be a problem. So they had to, they had to uh, polish the surface that had the, uh, all the square edges from the bands. Now, the thing that was amazing was, as I said, he had either four tons of liquid uh, molten speculum metal, or he had three and a half tons. And that metal had to be poured in three seconds into that mold. So he had a whole crew of guys that, that did it. If any of you have ever played with uh, solder, you know that if you drop molten solder on a surface and you touch it, it, it gets this, uh, forms this grainy structure. Uh, and he had that, that actually happen with the, the first mirror. It, uh, uh, he cast it, he, he didn't let it cure long enough and, it, uh, and it, it immediately went to grain. And then I think the second mirror, uh, cracked into a lot of different pieces. And finally, he realized that he's just going to have to anneal this thing for a long time. And so he had that annealing oven. He, he, he pulled the, the mirror into the annealing oven and keep that carefully heated with the, uh, 
with uh, uh, the uh, wood or the uh, uh, grass that they use for uh, for heating there, and it took 16 weeks to uh, to allow for cooling before the thing would uh, would uh, not crack and not uh, uh, deform or or become uh, grainy. And as I said, he, he did he did successfully cast, I think, mirror number three and mirror number five. And he wanted to do a, a, a another one, but he never got around to doing another one. It must have been a lot of effort to do this. So on the way back uh, uh, from Ireland, I, I did stop in, uh, in London at the uh, uh, at the Museum of Science there in uh, in in London, and looked at the uh, uh, one of the original mirrors. Uh, there were two, as I said, that were being used. One is missing. My guess is because it was made out of this brittle speculum that uh, it cracked and was uh, lost and they just didn't bother to, 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 to worry about keeping it. Now, if you're looking at that and you think that that's the actual mirror surface of the speculum, uh, you'd be sadly disappointed. What they did was they used a plate glass mirror and they laid, cut it to size and laid that on top of the speculum. I wouldn't be surprised if the mirror underneath is cracked and it was certainly well tarnished. So people are expecting this nice shiny bright mirror. Um, and I'll let's just go back for a moment. If you look down at the bottom, you can see the, uh, uh, well, well, we'll go forward a little bit. Uh, this is the mirror cell uh, construction that was used. I had uh, uh, triangles on top of triangles on top of triangles. So here's my interpretation of all the, all the different uh, triangles complete. Uh, it, was, it was an 81 point uh, uh, construction of the, of the cell and they used inch and a half diameter uh, metal gun balls to, uh, to, uh, as a contact surface to the actual uh, mirror. Uh, the speculum mirrors were approximately five inches thick uh, and as I said earlier, the lighter mirror exhibited more flexure than uh, William Parsons wanted. Now, if you look at this, this is a reflection of a mirror underneath. You can see some of the, uh, the lever structures for the, uh, for the mounting cells down below. And then finally, the polishing machine uh, uh, this is a model of the polishing machine. I'm not sure if, I don't think the uh, original machine still exists, uh, but William Parsons had to build his own steam engine to run this thing because uh, steam engines were still an early invention at this point in time. And they weren't, you couldn't just go to a catalog and buy one off the shelf. And this is a detail showing the, uh, uh, all the lever mechanisms for, for getting the figuring of the mirror just right. And you'll notice that the other counterweight uh, to adjust the, uh, the force on the mirror so that uh, the thing was somewhat autonomous in operation, I suspect. And finally, we'll finish up with the restoration project that, uh, that happened in the uh, um, 1995. Uh, uh, following a TV program, lecture, and a book by Sir Patrick Moore, there was a renewed interest in the six-foot telescope in the 1970s. In 1980, the seventh Earl of Rossi set about in an effort to restore the, the uh, telescope. It was estimated to be about 20,000 pounds to 30,000 pounds cost. In, the, in today's uh, money, the telescope cost more than a million euros or slightly more than a million dollars. The telescope, interestingly enough, was originally paid for by his wife's rental properties around the uh, uh, Isle, uh, around Ireland. No original construction drawings uh, remained of the uh, 
of the original fabrication of the telescope. But fortunately, his wife, Mary, was a medal-winning uh, pioneer photographer, and Burr Castle had one of the most elaborate darkroom, uh, darkrooms in Ireland. Um, so a lot of the information was uh, gotten from, uh, from these early photographs. Um, the structure was in incredibly poor condition. Most of the superstructure was dismantled in the early 1900s. Only the telescope tube, uh, which was wood, remained. Uh, engineer Michael Tudbury spent two years doing archaeological digs on the site and in the archives trying to figure out what was originally built. The original uh, telescope tube was in very poor condition. Uh, it was transported 30 miles away to a shop in County Galloway to be uh, uh, Galway to be reconstructed. Fabrication of the tube required the skills of a cooper or a barrel maker. Uh, they did try to salvage a few of the original timbers so that they could say that it was a reconstruction and not a, uh, not a complete uh, replacement of the original uh, tube. They, they did try to utilize as many of the original materials as they could. And you can see they grabbed some redwood from Finland on, also on the Baltic Sea. Uh, even the initial cleanup of the, uh, of the uh, castle structure was massive. They had to repoint all the masonry, obviously. But the vegetation had overgrown most of the telescope. And so obviously, that had to be removed first. And then finally, after, uh, after the telescope had been reconstructed, they brought it back in through one of the uh, castle gates that surrounded the, uh, the grounds of the, uh, of the castle. Uh, that, that must have been an exciting day uh, when, they, when they brought that back in. Uh, and I would comment that initially that uh, they did not raise enough money to put a mirror back in the telescope. But then shortly thereafter, they, uh, within a year or two, they did raise enough money to, to uh, have a new mirror fabricated. They wanted to keep the concept of using a, a metal mirror, only instead of dealing with uh, the uh, difficulties of uh, speculum, they cast this one out of solid aluminum so that it was a metal mirror. But just like the, uh, the speculum mirrors, the aluminum had to be uh, refigured every time that they repolished the mirror. It wasn't a matter of using uh, acid to etch off the, uh, the uh, silver coating or aluminized coating on a glass mirror. They actually had to uh, take off the aluminum oxide layer that would form on the surface of the aluminum. And finally, here's a uh, uh, an early fabric print from the Science Center uh, showing uh, somebody's interpretation of the, uh, of the telescope. And this is the uh, finished telescope that as I saw it in September of 2018. Now this trip, uh, besides being primarily for me to go see the telescope, was a uh, vacation trip. So I was traveling with a with a lady friend and uh, we visited around uh, Ireland and uh, we visited uh, Skellig Michaels Island where Star Wars was filmed and castle ruins, pubs, ancient monasteries, medieval music performances, stone circles, waterfalls, national parks, and even the giant causeway, which is uh, the crystalline structure at the north uh, shore like, the, like Devil's Tower. Uh, finally, we took a scenic train ride down to a, a town called Londonderry. And so I'd like to leave you with this uh, three minute video to give you a flavor of the, of the people of, of Ireland.
So that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Well, well, we'll take, well, that was great. Thank you. Um, and I thought the group 70 project was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a question um, uh, about the, uh, and maybe you know the answer. I don't know if there's enough documentation. I couldn't tell whether this was just a project put together with a grand design with all of the mechanics and uh, uh, you know fulcrum points and uh, leverage points all meticulously figured out in advance and then constructed or whether they started building it and went through an iterative process saying, oh, we need to add this counterweight here or else the whole thing is gonna collapse on our heads. And, and whether it just was built you know, to perfection in one fell swoop or whether they had to keep going back and adding to it and it was more of a Rube Goldberg invention. I, I From what my reading uh, uh, and research indicates, I think that the Earl basically had the whole thing designed in advance. However, obviously he had to go back and fine tune a lot of the positions of the weights and, and the amount of weight and whatever, to, because predicting what the friction would be in certain places <laughs> would have been pretty damn difficult. It would have been impossible, but, near but impossible at that he, time, yeah. I suspect that he had it pretty close to begin with, and then he could, uh, those counterweights, he could add sand to them or, or metal or whatever it was and, and take it out as necessary to, to affect the correct balance. But uh, I, I often wonder if maybe the, the level weights at the bottom, those might have been an add-on at the, at the end. But still, he had to, cut, he had to dig out that pit yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what actually led me to ask the question was your description of those lever weights, because that just was like, wow, where did this come from? <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, it, it just it just seemed um, uh, uh, like like this crazy idea, but it obviously, you know, served its purpose. Now, the actual spacing of those weights in my drawing that I have. That's that was conjecture on my part because I had no photographs. I never even saw the pit while I was there. All I saw was just the drawing that mentioned that there were three levers. And so I, I've extrapolated and came up with that guesstimate of what I thought it would actually look like. Very interesting. Uh, uh, May I ask? Yeah, go question? go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Dwight. One thing I've always wondered about, uh, ever since seeing the first uh, drawing of it when I saw it as a child, was was the azimuth. You said that they could observe an object for about one hour. Yeah. Which suggests to me that there's uh, what about seven degrees to the left and seven degrees to the right, something like that. Yeah. 
it it looks a lot more cramped than that when you're looking straight on. Yeah. But but in the field, you could see where there was a lot of swing possible. I mean, I, I I've always had admiration for the Earl of Rossi. Uh, you know, but after listening to all the pains and agony he went through to, to make this telescope, I, my admiration has, has no, no bounds. I mean, it's, it's increased by a factor of 10. This is an incredibly difficult task that required, I mean, we complain nowadays about, you know, mirror making. And I mean, what we have <laughs> is nothing compared with what he had yeah. to face. And, and I'm wondering, how did he get interested in astronomy? Do we know what, what motivated him to do this incredible task? Uh, I, I don't know as I have the answer for that. I think it's just something he wanted to do. He was also an electrical designer. He built this, uh, turbine for the, for the Camcor river and this, in the science center, they show all this switch gear that he had constructed and manufactured. They had, uh, they had motors and stuff, electric motors at Burr Castle back in the mid 1800s that's amazing was, they, was, was he university trained or i mean where did, what was his educational background any idea he did have some training in london but uh, i think he was more self-educated than uh than anything else his uh his son uh uh is the one who designed the turbines that we utilize on the uh the titanic and some of those other major ocean mm. uh, oh you're kidding that's an amazing story. Very darn. The Titanic I want to go was back and spend a, a whole day just in the science center because it's a that's an amazing facility just unto itself. You mean the London Science Center or the, the one that's local? No, at Burr Castle, there's a uh, there's a building that has four large size rooms that have a tremendous amount of exhibits in them. I I didn't even. I didn't even start to, to touch on that in this presentation because you could spend an hour talking about just the science center. So, so you are going to make arrangements to go back, I hope, and be able to, to go into the, into the construction and take pictures of those pits and, and do all now, that, I hope, right? I know that they were, they were talking about, the before COVID, they were talking about the possibility of going in and doing some cleanup work and getting the telescope operational again yeah and uh i was going to offer my services as a professional engineer because i've done some structural work and and i certainly could help them out with the uh, controls for the electrical controls on the hydraulics and whatever uh, but they'd have to have a, a local uh engineer because i'm not licensed in uh in uh, ireland if but, they need uh, some money, uh, you know, uh, please send us a contact information where we can send them some money to get this thing going. I, I'd be happy to contribute a little bit to get this going. The problem is uh, they spent almost a million dollars on the uh, renovation in 1995. And I suspect they'd have to spend another hundred thousand dollars or more to, to get it operational again. And they, I suspect they got to pull the mirror out and repolish that aluminum mirror that's been sitting there since 1995 out in in uh, Irish weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah the, I almost... the problem with projects like this is that every every goal involves you know a hundred tiny steps, and each one of those tiny steps becomes a project unto itself. Yeah. And uh, it's very expensive and very time consuming. Um, and it's remarkable that they managed to get through the first restoration that they did. That's really impressive. Yeah. But I'm not, it's also not surprising that they have to go back and do a lot of it again. Yeah. You know, um, I want to I want to uh, mention to our uh, listeners that uh, if you want to ask questions, please post them in the chat or QA section. Um, and here's one right now. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I don't know who uh, mentioned this, but um, uh, they were saying that the Parsons family was part of Grubb Parsons that built world-class telescopes through more than half of the 29th, uh, 20th century, not the wow. 29th century, 20th century. I don't have, the, oh, there it is. It just finally yeah, showed popped up. up. On my... Yeah, the 29th century is a typo. <laughs> 
Dwight, um, did you say that they had done some observing once they built the, uh, the aluminum mirror? Yes, uh, once a year they held a major star party. There is a club over there that kind of adopted the thing. Mm -hmm. And so they'd have this summer star party where they'd go in and they would actually observe at the, uh, at the telescope. Wow. Did you get any feedback from those guys? And any idea what, what it looked like? I, I, I'd be dying to see what this would look I, like. I, I have not uh, been in contact with that club. Uh, I understand from J. Kelly Beatty, uh, one of the editors at Sky and Telescope, mm -hmm. he saw it operational, I believe, in 1998. Mm -hmm. and, and then I talked with somebody at the Tri-Valley Stargazers who had been there uh, as part of that tour. And I think that tour happened in the early uh, 2000s. Yeah. Uh, and, and at that point, the telescope was not functional anymore. Uh, too bad. So it, it was, it sounds to me as though it was functional less than 10 years, but I, I don't know. I, we almost wonder whether they just should have put in a, a standard glass mirror rather than trying to do the aluminum. Um, well, yeah, no, I know where they could have gotten one. <laughs> for, for six foot glass mirror. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we <laughs> we know where one is. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be group seventy-two. <laughs> yeah, group seventy-two. That's right. So there's a question here about what eyepieces were yes. used historically. Oh, were yeah. they an optical design that we would recognize? Well, I'm sure that uh, that uh, he built his own eyepieces, ground his own eyepieces. So I have no idea. Uh, what they were. It was an interesting cell that you saw pictures of in the, uh, in, the in my presentation. Because uh, one of those things was like six inches in diameter, the, the, the cell structure. I, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that it was just, you know, a, you know at, at that time in the 1800s, eyepieces were pretty primitive. So they were like, you know, equivalent to like Kellner designs or something like that, very low eye relief. Uh, mm -hmm. but they were sizable. So you were able to, you know, they made up for that a little bit because of the aperture that they were dealing with. And the other thing that they did too was a so-called Herschelian observation where they would uh. they go to the front of the telescope and just look over the lip. Oh, interesting. And that's that's probably why that, that uh, uh, cart can go all the way across. Oh, yes. That's a, that's cheating. <laughs> I didn't mention that. But uh, so what's the F uh, ratio? I can't imagine what that looked like. But anyway, <laughs> Dwight, what's the uh, F ratio on the on the mirror on the original mirror? We we have an idea. It must be F what? Oh, is fifty four feet by uh, by six, six, six feet? Foot. Six feet. So uh, fifty four divided by six, right? So F nine. Yeah. There we go. I have a telescope that's an F9, but it's a little smaller. Uh, than that one. It's a so, smaller aperture. Yeah. yeah. The, the comment here is, if I understand your description of the azimuth thrust beam mechanism correctly, wouldn't it cause the tube to swing in an arc on the altitude line? Yes, it did. And I, this is something I don't understand. Theoretically, he was going to build a mechanism that would allow him to track so that he could do pho photographic uh, observations. Uh, but I don't know how you would do that because you're absolutely right. It's, it's going to be an arc uh, on, the, uh, on the altitude line, unless, unless what he was gonna do is manually titrate the uh, slow motion control to keep it in alignment somehow. <laughs> We did used to do that with astrophotography. You'd sit there and you'd dial the knobs. Manually. You'd just turn the knobs and you know for tracking. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have been difficult on that type of mounting, I, I would think. But I think the bigger problem was that the photographic plates just you know they didn't have any sensitivity at all. No, you yeah, could well, you could you couldn't uh, cheat by doing short exposures. Yeah, what no. would the film <laughs> speed on that be? Oh my god. Slow. 
ASA 20. So Dwight, do you have an idea when uh, my friend Carter would have gone to that dinner with the Earl of Rossi? What um, year was that? I, was that I, I was guessing that was around 2005, 2010, but I don't know. I don't you remember. Know, you know, Rich, what occurred to me is I can just imagine Carter going to this thing and getting access to the interior. We may have pictures of this structure in storage. We might. I do understand that they were allowed to go up the staircase on the west wall and walk around oh, my. the upper galleries, which I would have loved to have been able to do that. We might we might have slides of that. Yeah. Well, we if you do, might. I would love to see those. We just we got to find them. <laughs> Somewhere in that 400 set of 400,000 slides that we have. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> There's like a lot no, of slides. Right. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> Jesus. All right. I think we have another question here that popped up in our QA section. Uh, it was another another uh, qu uh, question from our first questionnaire. Um, uh, sorry for the typo. To my knowledge, the telescope was operational after renovation for a very short interval. I worked while on sabbatical with Dr. Michael Redfern at NUI Galway, who was involved in the renovation. Um, he had never observed at it. Oh, interesting. I'd like to know who this is so we can ask you more questions. Tell us who you are, please. Tell us who you are, because it just says anonymous attendee. I did try to get in touch with Michael Tudbrady, the, uh, the consulting engineer who did the renovation, and I got nowhere. But he was in his late 70s when he did the renovation, and I think that he may have passed on, so... The, the company that he worked for no longer exists either, so. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the group that came together to do the renovation? Are they, is, is it like a, 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 a club of some sort or was it an association of engineers or uh, how did this, how, how did that materialize? All right, well, it's, uh... It's this is a UNESCO site now, I believe. Wow. Oh, so, so it's is, a World Heritage site. Yeah. So it's got uh, European funding as part of it. And then there was an engineering group that was uh, involved in this as well. And there was a, actually a company that was created just to do the castings of all the individual uh, cast iron parts that were unique to this thing. Uh, so uh, I was just trying to find that slide. I didn't. Yeah, this really... this was spawned in someone's living room with a group of uh, some very ambitious and smart people, and then they turned it into uh, an institution. Yeah, the uh, the Earl of uh, Rossi, uh, the current Earl of Rossi, is the one who uh, uh, got it kind of moving, along with uh, Sir Patrick Moore. Ah, uh, okay. And so that, that got sense. it started, and then they had to start bringing in technical people who knew how to actually implement the thing. So this happened. This kind of happened from the top down, right? So the yeah. so the the Earl of Rossi was involved from the get go, and he had obviously, you know, uh, having Patrick Moore involved probably got a lot of publicity and money. Yeah. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, Rich Gabe uh, uh, mentioned that one of the challenges, aside from the weather in Ireland, is the latitude of 53 degrees. So it only gets to astronomical twilight at uh, summer solstice. Yeah, not the best place to place to put this thing. And oh, the yeah, there's a. Uh... I, here's a paragraph I didn't read. To remake a 58-foot tube, cast and install the metalwork, create the extraordinary Heath Robinson type wheels. I'm not familiar with that term. Pulleys, galleries, and gantries was also quite a challenge. However, o Owen McCarthy read about the proposed restoration and formed a company, Universal Works, to pitch the, for the contract. Owen's dedicated team created the whole working mechanism as an exact replica of the original. So you can see that this was a major undertaking, no matter how you figure it. Even, yeah. even the restoration work was involved 
tremendous numbers of people. Dwight, one thing I did not realize about the, the mirror structure until I saw your presentation here is that the, the speculum mirror is on this, this cart that actually gets wheeled into the telescope. And that cart stays in the inside the telescope, yes. does it not? Uh, now, that is pure speculation on my part. Huh. But how else would you do it? Yeah, they had no mechanism to lift it off of the cart and get it yeah, into there's a... No, there's no chance for putting a yeah. crane to lift it off the cart into the thing. Yeah, it would have been sense. easier to yeah. uh, load the cart into the... You saw how massive the mirror box was. Yeah. So they could just roll the cart in and then wedge it in place so it didn't move around. And yeah. so the float, so the flotation cell was on the top of the cart and the mirror on top of the flotation cell. That must be the way they did it. Yeah, I, I mean, how else would you get that mirror? What are you going to do? Take it off the cart somehow and slide it into the well, telescope box? Do you remember the pictures in the Museum of Science in London? Uh -huh. The mirror cells were observable underneath the cart. Yeah, that was integral somehow. Yeah, I, I bet you're right. I, I, Rich, can you think of any other way to do it? I cannot. No, it's, I think I think he's onto something there. Yeah, the way that they the way that they actually uh, annealed the mirror mm -hmm. is they had uh, they had uh, like a dozen guys uh, with some sort of a rope harness that they used to to slide it into the uh, annealing into the oven. Yeah. yeah. And then they'd have to pull the harness out so it wouldn't catch on fire. Wow. And you said that the annealing, annealing process took several hours, five hours, I think you said, four or five? It took six weeks. Oh, geez. And they had to keep that thing fired up all the time, and they had to slowly cool it down. I think you you were ref referring to get grass to burn, but you, did you mean peat? Peat. There we go. I couldn't. I drew. I was having a senior moment. I couldn't remember. <laughs> I have senior moments every day of my life. Um, but wow. but it must have been quite the panic to pour four tons of speculum in three seconds. Oh, what a nightmare. And so they had these rings, these concentric rings. I, I don't know, I still don't understand how they formed that. You said they did it upside. Can you explain that part again? I'm well, the, the, where they, the, the bottom of the, um, of, of, of the mold was essentially roughly the, uh, the uh, uh, focal length of the mirror, right? I mean, it was, had the right curve yeah. and you didn't want the bubbles to uh, form on the optical side of the speculum. So you yeah. had to pour it upside down. So, so basically, I don't think you understand what I was talking about. I don't. Imagine, if you will, you got a one inch uh, ring, mm -hmm. an inch and a quarter inch ring, mm -hmm. all the way up to a 72 inch ring. Yeah. So you've got like uh, many dozens of rings in this thing. Yeah. And you could, you could, lift up the center so that you'd mirror the concavity of the uh, of the uh, shape that you want when you were ultimately finished I and then see. so you'd have all these uh, all these ridges kind of like a uh, Fresnel lens yes uh, that you'd have to polish off all the edges until you got it down smooth okay I I've got it now I can visualize that thing thank you A lot of work. <laughs> and six right. guys to operate the telescope. Perfect. All right. Let's see if there's any no other questions. So uh, here comes another one. Ah, he, he, the, 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 our gentleman here has identified himself, uh, Dr. Harold Nations at the College of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas. And uh, he visited uh, uh, the Ross Telescope twice, last time in 2011. Uh, thanks you for a nice talk. Uh, and he's wondering if the castle is uh, still open for tours, even if the telescope isn't operational. Uh, yes, the uh, the castle has certain days of the week that you can go into the castle. The uh, they do they do an organized tour of like an hour or something, and the earl still lives there, so he may participate in some of the tours. Uh, 
because I, I understand he was the host for the dinner for the uh, for the uh, ancient telescope group, uh, and then they've got those uh, what was it 1,200 acres of uh, of, of formal gardens that uh, people can can tour. Uh, that's that's where they make all their money is off from the uh, people going to the gardens. I was the only one that was hanging out by the the telescope. <laughs> uh, you know, I just realized Ken Lumb is a member of the Antique Telescope Society. I wonder if he yeah. was there then. Ken, if you're out there, answer the question. I don't know if he's here tonight. He may not be. I'll call I don't him up. See, I don't see him on on the list. And then, yeah, and we then, should find uh, out. That would be good to know. And then they do have uh, there an, uh, an operational LOFAR a radio telescope installation that's part of the European low fire network. So low frequency something or other. I don't know the whole acronym. I'm not much into radio telescopes and I was so enthralled and had only had a certain amount of time for the for the Leviathan and the uh, and the Vista Center. So uh, I'll definitely take a, a, a visit to the low fire the next time I go but uh, I, I didn't I didn't even bother to go to it during this trip. Dwight, I think the Irish uh, tourist, now, at least North Irish tourist board ought to hire you. Um, <laughs> I think they'd make a lot of money from you. That was that was great. I mean, I, I, I am really motivated now to go visit this. Thing. I know it sounds like a great trip, doesn't, doesn't it? Doesn't it, though? I yeah, mean, I bet yeah. you there are people out there watching this program right now are thinking the same thing we are. By the way, you the uh, your club is now the ninth club that I've given this presentation to. So I nice. am getting the word out slowly but surely. <laughs> well, don't be surprised if a few more clubs invite you, Dwight, and we may be the culprits in that regard. Uh -oh. uh, I mean, you're one of the reasons I invited you was that uh, the president of Tri Valley spoke very highly of your talk. So, oh, well, I'm I'm pleased that he was happy. I, I I'm going to say as a speaker. Uh, it's a little disconcerting that I'm just talking to my screen. Yes. I, don't, I got no feedback at all. Yeah. Oh, we're giving you plenty of you... feedback. <laughs> just many, Dave and I. How many, how many people do you have? Uh, club we had um, some people have dropped off already, but we had about uh, 25 or 30 uh, listening tonight. So anyway, and, then, and then there were another a, a handful on Facebook. I've done I've done some presentations to groups of sixty or more, yeah. Uh, and it's not a problem. I just have some of the pictures in the background so that I can see if I'm putting people to sleep or. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I did have a problem with a mute button in the middle of this. I think there was yeah, a I replied. I didn't talk. Yeah, I, I caught that and I asked you to unmute at the uh, in, when, when I saw that happen. Um, we, we get a lot of people watching the uh, presentations after the fact, too, by putting it up in YouTube. We get to uh, capture an audience that otherwise can't make it on a Saturday night. Now, so. uh, you, you guys probably technically you want to uh, cut that uh, video out. At yeah, the end. you're probably right. And oh. uh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that. And I will do so. So we don't get uh, uh, the uh, the Irish police on our case. Although it's it's now more than ten years old, so <laughs> I don't I don't know they get too upset about it. I I don't think technically I'm even allowed to show it, but it's it was such a wonderful piece to end end the show with. So. It, it is wonderful. I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah, uh, Harold Nations uh, wanted to remind us that this is in the Republic of Ireland, not in Northern Ireland. Oh oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, on my part, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I did visit Northern <laughs> Ireland. I also, well, I, actually, I drove about 800 miles during that week, all the way from Southern Ireland to, to Northern Ireland. The only place I didn't get to see at all was Galway off to the west. Uh, that, that's yeah. a place I will visit at some point. Well, we'll make it an EIS tour, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for attending. And uh, Dwight, it was a pleasure meeting you tonight. And uh, uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time and staying up late to give us this excellent talk. And uh, thank you, Dave. My pleasure. Yeah. And we'll see everybody next month. And uh, 
Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Good night, folks. Good night.